evening. Good evening. Uh, wow, it is good to have that crew back together uh, to welcome us on a Wednesday evening. Um, we are studying the book of Colossians. If you could make your way there. Uh, before we open up in a word of prayer, I, I want to briefly look at where we ended last week. Um, last week, in, in an hour, we made it through a whopping two verses. Um, there was some introductory material, but we made it through Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. And verse 2 ends with the Apostle Paul's uh, blessing uh, to the church in Colossae. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And as we were in this room last Wednesday, um, I concluded with this idea of grace and peace. He says, when it comes to grace, uh, I pray that you sing with the hymn writer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When it comes to peace, I pray that you sing with the hymn writer. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. It is well, it is well with my soul. As we enter into Bible study, I pray that this last week has been one of grace and peace. Uh, if not, um, may it be so in the week to come. Um, thank you for joining us here in the room and, and those tuning into the broadcast. Uh, as we begin, let us have a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful uh, that here and now in, in a crazy world uh, that, that seems to change by the minute, we're so thankful uh, that we can rest in your grace and peace. Father, I, I pray for this group gathered in this room, for those tuning in to the broadcast, that over this last week, that we've experienced your grace, that we've experienced moments when, when you've provided for us, even in our disobedience and our in our rebellion, um, I pray there's been moments when we've experienced uh, your grace toward us. And Father, I, I pray that that grace has brought us peace in, in a world where we could easily be tossed uh, from side to side. Um, where we can easily be pulled from this direction and that direction. And we're thankful that you can provide us peace. And Father, if that has not been our story in this last week, may it be our story in the week to come. May we seek you above all things. And you promise us that when we seek you, we find you. And Father, in this moment, uh, as we gather around your word, uh, may we seek you, and may we find you in the pages of Scripture. And may that provide us grace and peace right here and right now. Father, I know that in this room, uh, and those tuning into the broadcast, there, there are plenty of need. There is a lot of, of stress and worry. Father, I pray that in this moment that all those distractions would be put aside. And that we would focus our attention on your word. And we would hear from you. And then in this moment, you would build us up. Uh, you would equip us as your word promises to do. Father, we're thankful for your word. We open it now, and we pray all these things in Jesus' 
name. Amen. Um, Last week, we covered some introductory material um, on the book of Colossians, and then we walked through verses 1 and 2. That's all we did. So if you weren't here last week or if you you missed um, that uh, broadcast, uh, you missed a lot, of course, but but you're not too far behind. I I encourage you, go back and uh, go to our website, and you can watch uh, the first Uh, session through the first two verses. The big thing you need to know uh, when you look at the book of Colossians, we'll we'll see it eventually uh, when we get um, really into uh, verse 15 of of chapter 1. You can easily break uh, the book of Colossians into two parts. Um, the, The first two chapters really speak of the supremacy of Christ, that Christ is above all things. Uh, And the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in chapter 1 and chapter 2 to show us Jesus. How he is the Christ. uh, How he is above all things. And then you move into chapters 3 and 4. And you move from seeing the supremacy of Christ to seeing submission to Christ. While chapters 1 and 2 are highly theological, chapters 3 and 4 are highly practical. And we'll see that as we walk through. We'll read 1 and 2, we've covered them already, and then we'll move into verse 3. Uh, Colossians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother... To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And here's the blessing we read a moment ago. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. And moving into new ground, we'll slowly walk through verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Let's read verse 3 one more time. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We, we touched on this a bit last week, but, but Paul is taking the, the customary letter writing of the ancient Near East first centuries, following those formats, but he's, he's infusing that format with Christian significance. Ancient Near East first century documents, letters, always began with a word of thanksgiving to the gods. It would be quite common to to see a a word offered to gods, and and to many of them, as many as you could write, as many as you could think of. Uh, But the Apostle Paul here, who's already declared that He's an apostle of Jesus Christ, not by his own will, but by the will of God. In verse 3, he doesn't thank a a long list of false gods, of idols created by man. He, He thanks God. And when the apostle Paul says that, he he means the, the God of that we see in our Bible, the God, the God that created the heavens and the earth, the God that creates all things and then calls people to him. And we see all these beautiful stories in our Old Testament. We see God take on flesh in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Paul says, I always thank God. And we know who he's talking about. Then you got to, I don't know if your habits when you're reading the scripture, uh, I don't know if you read it quickly or if you stop and, and meditate on words and phrases. The Apostle Paul here says he always thanks God. There's a couple ways you could look at that. There's some people, if they told me, you know, I'm always thanking God, 
If that's a true statement, maybe that's a bit boastful, right? That you would tell me that you're always thanking God. And then if some people told it to me, I'd go, is that a truthful statement? But if you know the story of the Apostle Paul, I don't think it's a boastful statement at all. Uh, I also don't think it's false piety. I think Paul means it. This is the same man that in other places will instruct the church to pray without ceasing. To, to, to always pray. And, and here he's stating, he's giving us a glimpse into his own prayer life. And of course, he, he's attaching Timothy, the co sender. We always thank God. I, I, I think Paul is a man devoted to God, and thus he's a man devoted to prayer. Which I read that. If I, I was reading this at my own kitchen table, I would read that and I'd go, I would say that's true of Paul, devoted to God and thus devoted to prayer. And then I would have to look inward. Could that be said of me? Uh, could I honestly say that I'm always in prayer? And when I'm in prayer, am I always thanking God? I won't reveal my answer to that question, but I'll ask it of you. Uh, are you devoted to prayer? Can, can you be described as one who always thanks God? God. And I think that's interesting. Maybe you are one of prayer. Maybe you are devoted to God and thus you were devoted to prayer. But, but what if I had to, what if we could chart your prayers? And, and we could see the things that you prayed for and the things you prayed about and the, and the types of prayers you made to God. How, how much of your prayer life is comprised of thanksgiving. I will reveal my answer to that one. Um, I don't know if I would like to see that chart. <laughs> I, th I think I ask a lot of God when I pray. I think I remind him of a lot of things that I'd like to see go differently than they're currently going. I think a lot of my prayers are reminding God of my need. Um, and I, th I think if I could chart my prayer, it, my thanksgiving to God would be lacking. Uh, I think that's a helpful reminder for all of us this evening. Apostle Paul says, we always thank God. We always thank God, and he gives a bit of a descriptor there. The, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. But the descriptor there, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we, we probably, if we're sitting at home, this all seems elementary, and we breeze past that. Just a customary greeting. He prays. Okay, but let's, let's take a moment here. We get a, a very detailed description. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So immediately for me, I hear that, and, and I picture Jesus' baptismal scene. Where Jesus is in the Jordan River, John the Baptist is taking him under the water, and as he comes up, the heavens split open, and the Spirit descends, and, and the voice from heaven, God's voice, rings out from heaven for Jesus to hear, for everyone else to hear, this is my son, my beloved son, 
whom I love, and with him I'm well pleased. It's a beautiful description of God the Father, Jesus the Son. This isn't just church language. Paul is making some very important theological distinctions. God, as we see fully revealed in the New Testament, there's God the Father and Jesus, God the Son. But then in that description, we're given Lord Jesus Christ. That's actually one name and three and two titles. Lord Jesus, the name, and Lord, a title, Jesus, a name, Christ, a title. He's Lord. In ancient Near East, uh, Lord would have been used uh, as a title to express honor and respect to, to someone in position, someone in authority. We can actually read numerous instances of this in our New Testament itself. People will encounter Jesus, that they will see him as a teacher or as a healer, and they will give him the title Lord out of respect. You, you can see this in many examples. Uh, you can see it in, in Matthew chapter 8. When a, a leper approaches, approaches Jesus, and out of respect for the fact that he's a healer, he's a teacher, he's given the title Lord. But of course, after the resurrection, uh, the title Lord carries much more significance. It's not just a, a sign of respect. It's not just giving honor, saying that Jesus is Lord, or, or saying the name Lord Jesus. You are declaring Jesus is not just a teacher. Not, Jesus is not one worthy of mere respect. But Jesus is God. And what bring, that brings to mind is that famous scene and post-resurrection, post that first Easter morning in John chapter 20, that famous doubting Thomas scene where Thomas, for whatever reason, hasn't been with the group. He has not seen the resurrected Jesus with his own eyes, so, so Thomas is, is not going to believe it. Jesus appears once again. Thomas wants to see the nail scars. Jesus, in a pure act of grace, allows him to see the wounds. And it's then that Thomas says, My Lord and my God. Not just respect at that point. Not just giving Jesus honor. The, the title Lord is a declaration of who Jesus is. He, he is God. He is God's son. But here this title, he's Lord, and he's Jesus. And we, we often put uh, we see it done in the New Testament. We do it in, in our own language. We, we tend to run Jesus Christ together as if it's his first and his last name. But Christ is another title. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one the Old Testament spoke of. He's the one who fulfills the Old Testament promises. He's Lord. He's Jesus and he's the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. In this simple verse, Apostle Paul saying, we always thank God. What do you mean by that? You know, we know this in our own day and age. A lot of people will, will speak spiritual language and speak in spiritual generalities. This is very specific. This is a detailed description of who God is. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he finishes it off, when we pray for 
you. Isn't that interesting? Paul prays, and in his prayers, he prays for the church in Colossae. Why? Into verse 4. You still with me? Can I hear an amen? Amen. All right. Verse 4. So he's praying. He's praying a lot. He's praying to God uh, when he prays for the church in Colossae. Verse 4. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. You may have there all the saints or all the holy people. So he's praying. He's praying a lot because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. Now, if you you weren't here last week, let me catch you up a bit. What we're about to see here in Colossians chapter 1 of is evidence that gives us clues um, that the Apostle Paul was not the one who founded this church in Colossae. We, we actually have a, a lot of evidence in, in the language in this letter that perhaps uh, Paul's never even been there. Uh, he, he doesn't even know this church. And you can read the book of Acts, you read Acts 19, you can, you can see that the, the apostle Paul preached in nearby Ephesus, and he had this habit, he would go into the synagogue and he would begin discussions about the kingdom of God. He'd walk into the synagogue and have an open conversation about the kingdom of God, And we're told there in Acts 19 that the Apostle Paul does this for two years to where everybody in the region knows the good news. So we can assume, as we'll see here in a moment, there's a gentleman named Epaphras from the church in Colossae, but perhaps before it was even a church that Epaphras leaves Colossae, travels to Ephesus, Hears the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Comes to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Takes it back home. Shares it with his friends and family. And the church in Colossae is born. Here in verse 4, Paul saying, We thank God for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. So think about this. Also, again, if you, if you weren't here last week, let me catch you up a bit. We, we often think uh, we, uh, um, that Paul's writing this letter, 60, 61 A.D., while confined in prison in Rome. So think about this, that statement. He's heard of their faith and love for the people. Colossae in modern-day Turkey, news of their faith and love for people has traveled from modern-day Turkey to the capital of the Roman Empire and then into Paul's confinement. Whew. That's another moment where I have to stop and allow the the scripture to peer inside of me. Man, who, who, who are the ones hearing about my faith? Who are the ones telling the stories about my love for God's people? Again, I, I won't reveal my answers to those questions, but I'll ask them of you. I mean, is the news spreading of your faith in Jesus Christ? Is is the news spreading of your love for all of God's people? This church in this small farming community in modern-day Turkey has big faith in big love. So so much so that, that the news of that is spreading. 
or the Apostle Paul hears it in confinement, in, in the midst of his own chains, he hears of their faith and their love, which, again, reminds me of that incident in, in Matthew 22, um, where, where an expert in the law comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, I, I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> you find this, Matthew 22, it's verse 30 through 40. This expert in the law says, teacher, what... Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And, and Jesus replied, you know this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It appears... That the church in Colossae is living that out. They've got big faith in God and big love for others. So much so that that news is spreading. That, that news is getting back to the Apostle Paul. The, ultimate purpose. We're about to see a discussion here from, from verse 5 into, into verse 6. Um, we're about to see a glimpse into the spiritual maturity of this particular church. And we're about to see a discussion about the gospel. When, when we talk about the gospel, we, we talk about the, the, the purpose of the gospel to, is to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. That's absolutely true. Um, but there's a lot of times when we speak about the gospel, we, we speak about the, the gospel bringing in the lost. And we make the gospel as if it's supposed to be just a one-time thing, right? I, I hear the gospel once. I receive the gospel once. And what we're about to see through these next few verses, yes, the, the, the gospel is about bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ, but it's also about spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. 1 Peter 1, 2, and 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. God is greatly concerned with the lost coming to salvation, but he also puts... <laughs> Extreme importance on spiritual maturity for the saved. And we see this church living that out well. Verse 3, Apostle Paul and Timothy are always thanking God. Verse 4, why? Because we have heard of your faith and of your love for all God's people. Into verse 5. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. And about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. So think about this. You still with me? Can I hear an amen? They've... they've Got faith and love. And then here in verse 5, we're told the source of their faith and love. Right? They're commended for their big love and their big faith. And we're told in verse 5 that, that that comes, that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven. Faith 
and love that is springing from hope. It's an interesting trio. If you you walk through Paul's letters, he often links those trio, that that trio together of faith, hope, and love. We see it in Romans 5. We see it in 1 Corinthians 13. We see it in 1 Thessalonians 1. It appears that faith, hope, and love are basic characteristics of the Christian life. That as believers, as ones who embrace Jesus as Lord, we should have evidence in our lives of faith, hope, and love. And I wasn't planning to go this route, but man... Just imagine, in the days that we're living in, if this group, just this group right here, if this group, in the midst of all the news of doom and gloom, if this group was a source to the world around us of faith, hope, and love. I think it could make a big difference. I really do. Um, Paul, as I, I mentioned, he, he likes to link these, this trio of characteristics together. Here we're given a unique angle on it. The, the faith and love spring from hope. And where's that hope? It's stored up for us in heaven. Right? This hope doesn't come from us. We're not manufacturing it. We're not just putting on a smile even though bad things are happening. We're living out faith. We're living out love because we have a source of hope that's coming not from us. We have a hope that comes from God. And this is where I always have to make a distinction here. Uh, our culture, the, the world around us, will use the word hope. You know, I, I hope this will happen. Well, I, I hope that works out for you. you know, it's kind of like hope is just wishful thinking. Uh, or hope is taking a chance. No, in, in the biblical sense... Hope is not wishful thinking or or taking a chance on a hunch. Hope is a true source that that comes to us from God. That, That our hope is rooted in and powered by the faithfulness of God. It's, that's our, our source of hope. If, if we're placing our trust in the promises of God, right, hope is not wishful thinking. It's, it's not taking a chance. A, a hope is merely us standing upon the promises of God that we just haven't seen come to full reality yet. Our hope that comes from God should lead us to live lives of faith and love. To to finish this verse, that that faith and love, back to verse 5. The faith and love that spring up from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. Does everybody... Do you end verse 5 with the word gospel? Do we have anything else present in the room? Some tra- what do we got? Good news? Anybody else? The gospel. Sometimes we'll get real literal there. This is the gospel. The good news. 
Again, that's, that's another church word. We might breeze past that when, when we're reading this on our own. Perhaps we've heard that word so much it, it loses its meaning for us. If you're up for it, I, I would ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 for a moment. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll, we'll grab the first eight verses for a moment. As our group here is flipping, if, you, if you're watching this broadcast on a computer, uh, a telephone, uh, a TV set, uh, please flip to 1 Corinthians 15 with us. Everybody there, can I hear an amen? amen. Um, Apostle Paul here, uh, we're going here because the Apostle Paul gives a summary of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 5 makes a reference to something they've heard before in the gospel. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, we have a summation of the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel, the good news I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and, and last of all, he appeared to me also. And then He gives a unique way of describing his Damascus Road experience. As to one abnormally born. He he didn't come to faith like the rest of them. Apostle Paul had to get blinded and and knocked off a horse to to come to faith. He's a little different than all of them. But but listen to that quick recap of the gospel. that, That Christ died for sins according to the promises of God in the Bible, and and that he rose from the dead according to the promises provided in the Bible. And then after that, he appeared to people. And he gives us a long list. He appeared to Cephas, and then the 12, and then to 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, and, and many of whom are still living. Why would he write that? Because as he writes 1 Corinthians 15, those people are still walking around. Right? If you don't trust the scriptures, go ask the people that saw it with their own eyes. A brief summation of the gospel and notice this is what I received I pass on to you of first importance and this is something I think we fail to grasp how powerful that eight verses of 1 Corinthians 15 is like, not only is it the message, the hope, the, the gospel that saves us, but we as the people in this very room, we are the continuation of that story. That, that, that story got shared, and it got shared, and it got shared. And it got shared till eventually it came to the person that shared it with you. 
But the message doesn't stay the same. We should be speaking these very words. Right? The, the next to person that, that we speak the gospel to, we should say, hey, I speak this to you. I pass this on to you as a matter of first importance. Right? I don't care about what you think is important right now. What I'm about to tell you is more important. Right, what I'm about to share with you overrides anything that you thought was important before this very conversation. We're, we're stepping into that story. I can tell you the, the first time I heard the gospel, I, I can paint for you the scene when I walked into a church for the first time and realized that these people were speaking of a salvation I did not have. I can tell you the stories about Dennis who brought me into his home and began to show me and tell me and preach to me and demonstrate for me in, in living color what these things really meant. He passed them on to me as a matter of first importance that, that Christ died for me, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And it's by that gospel that I'm saved. What happened there, that, that, that retelling of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, you, you bring it into Colossians 1. In this church, they, they have big faith and they've got big love that, it, that is coming from this hope stored up for them in heaven. And Paul says, you know, but I, I don't have to retell these things to you. <laughs> I'm going to, but I don't have to because you've heard them before. And this true message of the gospel. Anytime you, you hear that word gospel or good news, I, I invite you to go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, and here, Apostle Paul summarize it for you. Verse 6. If you're still with me, can I hear an amen? We're going to stop at verse 8. So we've only got three to go. Um, why are we laughing? Um, what, what does that mean? Is it, was that a nervous laughter, a joyful laughter? Um, okay, verse 6. Um, and, and please know, I, maybe I should have said this at the beginning. Um, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, loves to write really long sentences. Um, uh, this whole paragraph that we're reading uh, this evening is one long sentence in Paul's Greek. Um, so when we decided to many, many, many years later attach verse numbers, we didn't know quite where to put them. Um, so here's a great evidence of five and six really run together because uh, we have no good place to, to put the verse numbers. Uh, but verse six is continuing uh, what we saw in verse five. Verse five, uh, which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel into verse 6, that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's Grace. So, faith and love that are springing from hope stored up in heaven. And we now see its impact. It's not small. Apostle Paul describes it in numerous ways, but keeps using this language that it's bearing fruit and growing. Not only in the lives of the people in Colossae, but it has a bigger and wider impact. The gospel, the good news of Jesus cannot be confined. It cannot be contained. Since this gospel's come to you, 
And in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it been, has been doing among you. Remember, again, the gospel is intended to save the lost, but it's also intended to mature the saved. The same gospel that they're preaching is the gospel that is growing and bearing fruit in them. And it's got a worldwide impact. It's, it's growing throughout the world. We'll eventually get to Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, where we're told that in Christ there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, scathian, slave, or free. This gospel affects all places and all people. There's no one outside of its reach. Uh, you keep on reading in the New Testament. You'll eventually get to the last book, uh, the book of Revelation. In Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, we get a description of worship in heaven. And there we're told, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Did you notice that? You've heard it before, but every nation, tribe, people, and language. This gospel message, this good news, can't be confined to a place, can't be confined to a people. If we as the church are doing this right, <laughs> the, the, the gospel should be bearing fruit in us. It should be growing in us. The gospel message should be leading us, me, you, into spiritual maturity. And then because of that, we should be living and speaking, acting in such a way that the gospel is overflowing from this place and your living room and in your workplace, that the power of the gospel not confined to, to our places or to your home, but it continues to go out. As people hear this good news of a Savior who, who died according to the Scriptures and then who was buried and rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. It's by that gospel we are saved. One commentator said, Just as a tree without fruit or growth would no longer be a tree, so a gospel that bore no fruit would cease to be a gospel. Uh, the gospel that the Bible describes, real good news, bears fruit. Verse 7. You learned it. From Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. So again, a bit of a recap, and then I won't retell this story anymore. I'll, I'll just expect you to know it. It, it appears from e everything we've read this evening that Paul's not the one that founded this church. From reading the Acts account in Acts 19 and pairing it with Colossians 1, we, we gain this idea that Paul was preaching in nearby Ephesus. He does this for two years. He preaches it so loudly and so clearly that everybody in the region hears the gospel. We assume that Epaphras in Colossae travels to Ephesus, or, or maybe somehow the gospel gets back to uh, Epaphras, but Epaphras appears to be the one who hears the gospel, believes, takes it back home, and preaches the gospel. And it's now Epaphras who's speaking this good 
news. You learned it from Epaphras. We'll see his name again in Colossians 4.12. We, uh, we assume that this is the same Epaphras mentioned in verse 23 of the book of Philemon. Philemon has no chapter, so it's just Philemon 23, verse 23. Here in Colossians 1.7, he's identified as a fellow servant and also a faithful minister. That reference in Philemon 23, he's identified as a fellow prisoner. It appears that Paul and Epaphras have a lot in common. But let's spend a few minutes here looking at these descriptors. As you learned this gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time here, but this is a, a Bible study. It allows me to, to dig a little deeper than I would on a Sunday morning. We translate the Greek word there as servant. Um, it, it's the Greek word doulos with if you were looking at any dictionary of the Greek language, the proper translation of that is slave. In our English translation, the word slave carries a lot of baggage, so we like to go with the word servant. But I think if you're really wanting to get to the root of what that descriptor means... Slave works. Slave works. <laughs> Epaphras is a slave. Why? Because he's made Christ Lord. When the Lord speaks, one listens Paphros is a, is a servant uh, he, he's a slave uh, he is submissive to Jesus his Lord uh, Paphros is also described as a, as a faithful minister this is another one that's interesting in our English translations the, the word we have as minister in, in the NIV that I just read, um, is actually the, the Greek word diakonos. That's where we get the, the Baptist position, office of, of deacon. Which again, if you, if you took that word and just translated it, there you would actually get servant. Uh, that's, why, that's why I like the first one, being slave, because you actually have a repetition of words there. Um, so, so much so that in the NIV they have to change servant to minister to make those two words sound different. Um, but he's, a, he's a, a slave and a servant. Uh, or if you want it, he's, he's a servant and a minister. But, but the idea is he's made Jesus Lord. So, so he does everything that the Lord asks him to do. He has submitted his life. To Jesus. So that, that, again, makes me look inward. How would I be described in regard to my relationship with Jesus? Would any of those work for me? Could I be described as a servant or a slave? Could I be described as a, as a servant or a minister? Again, I won't answer that for myself, but I'll ask that question to you. How would you be described in regard to your relationship with Jesus? Again, the beauty of Epaphras here in Colossians chapter 1 is that if we weren't reading it here together, 
and you were asked, who's Epaphras in the Bible? Many of us wouldn't have a good answer. We know Paul. To a lesser degree, we know Timothy. But, but here's Epaphras, someone unknown to many of us. But it's through his faithfulness to Jesus that a church is born in Colossae. And because that church is born, Apostle Paul writes a letter to them that we're still reading today. Because of the faithfulness of one man who many of us would struggle to identify. Wrapping it up. You, you learned it back into seven and then we'll roll into eight. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. So you get another interesting detail there. Not only did the church in Colossae hear the gospel from Epaphras, it also seems to be that Epaphras is the source um, speaking to Paul of all the good news of their big faith and their big love and their hope. It says, and who also told us, it was Epaphras that, that, that told Paul and Timothy of their love in the spirit. And it's with that uh, final line in, in verse 8 that um, these first eight verses uh, provide us a, a glimpse uh, into what we call uh, the Trinity, Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. We, we see numerous references in the early verses to, to God the Father. We see many references to God the Son here in verse 8. Uh, we see a reference to God the Spirit. We look at these eight verses. You see a... A small church in a farming community in modern-day Turkey who had the gospel preached to them. And they embraced that gospel. And using the language of 1 Corinthians 15, it is by that gospel that they are saved. It's by that gospel upon which they're taking their stand. They've heard that gospel. They've received it. Again, I want to play this up and then we'll be done. This fa small farming community in modern day Turkey. We, we don't even have much record of the existence of the city. We've got a few coins very small historical record. But at one point, they heard Epaphras preach the gospel. And they received it. And then that hope stored up in heaven began to produce in them big faith. And big love. To the point that that gospel began to bear fruit in the lives of this particular church. And then it began to spread from this tiny church. It began to have incredible impact. This past weekend, Katie and I went to Canton. It was my first experience of all things Canton, and uh, it, it was a great experience. Uh, I'll go back sometime. <laughs> I bought three books, so it, was, it really was a great experience. But one of the things we bought, uh, we've been looking for, for something to, to represent Sulphur Springs in the little entryway uh, of our house. And uh, we've been looking at a couple things. Katie will see something somewhere and she'll shoot me a picture. No, that's not it. That's not it. We went into one vendor and we found he 
was repurposing old windows. And inside this old window, he had inserted a poster of beef and dairy cows. It has the different cows all lined up and named, you know, um, we said perfect, right? Dairy capital of Texas, you walk into our house and, and there will be our cow display. All, all that to say. Um, who, who knows what, what history will say of the people of Sulphur Springs? Um, who knows? Um, I, I assume those, those big dairy cows won't, won't stand there forever. Um, but the people in this room uh, hold the gospel. That, that will survive into eternity. And that, that this group right here, uh, because of the gospel, can, can demonstrate gospel-sized faith and, and gospel-sized love and gospel-sized hope that can not only change our eternities, but the eternities of those around us. So I'm coming to church uh, at times can seem like no big deal. But oh, it is. We're standing upon a gospel that has a worldwide impact and can take someone from, from the depths of hell to the glories of heaven if we're faithful gospel preachers. In the week to come, may we be faithful to the gospel that saved us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for, for this group gathered in this room. I'm thankful for those that are tuned in to this broadcast. And, and Father, I'm thankful for um, the, the beauty of technology. That there will be people, um, perhaps watching this weeks from now, in years from now. And, and while my suit might be outdated by then, um, the, the truth of this gospel will not be outdated. Uh, that the truth of a resurrected Savior will never grow old will never be outdated. Father, may, may we be people that hear, receive, and stand upon your good news. Father, I pray in, in the week ahead that you would open up doors and windows and conversations and opportunities and situations for us to speak of the good news of Jesus Christ. And may you fill us with courage May you fill us with passion. May you fill us with a desire to be proclaimers of your good news. And Father, tonight, as we gather together, um, we know that there are many people in our church in all sorts of need. Um, some we know about and, and some we don't. Uh, Father, we lift those uh, to your care. We, we intercede on their behalf and we pray that you would meet all of their needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Father, your, your word tells us that a, as a church we should pray for those who are sick. Uh, Father, we lift up those who are ill at this moment, those in a hospital room, those headed to a hospital room, those in recovery, Father, we, we lift them up to you and we trust you as the one with the ability to heal. We ask that you would uh, because we know that you can. Father, we know that there, there are people in our midst, people in our churches that are having uh, family struggles and issues, uh, marital issues, 
um, job issues, financial issues. Father, uh, we pray that in the midst of all those problems, that, that those folks would feel your peace and your grace. And those not just be words, but may those be spiritual reality for those folks in need. Father, we pray for this church. May we always be faithful to you and you alone. May nothing prevent us from being the church that you have called us to be. And Father, as I, as I often pray, as, as the pastor of this church, if there are areas that we are getting it right, may the wind be at our back. May we move full steam ahead. And Father, we pray if there are areas that we are getting it wrong, areas in which we have drifted off course or purposely went the wrong direction, Father, we pray for your rebuke and correction. Uh, bring us back to your will. And Father, we pray if there are areas where, where we, we are just absent, where our eyes are closed or our backs are turned, Father, open us, awaken us, to what you want from us. We confess that you are God and we are not, that this is your church. And we pray for your will to be done here at First Baptist, for your will to be done here in Sulphur Springs as it is in heaven. Father, as we leave this place tonight, may we put our head on our pillows this evening. And may we rest in the fact that you are our creator our sustainer, our provider, and our redeemer. May, those, may that, the truth of who you are allow us to sleep well tonight. And may we wake up in the morning ready to follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.